Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 812. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 18th, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We are so glad you could join us for kind of our, our fun spot. This is, you know, we're, George and I go to our happy place. We turn on the webcams and we talk about news. And uh, this to us is a therapy. And for some reason, you guys watch it and you like it as well. We appreciate that. If you have comments about the show, the best place to put that is the comments section on YouTube. You can find that at the bottom of the show notes on our YouTube channel. But what we want you to do most is to subscribe. I noticed that about 40% of viewers are not subscribers, and that's kind of hard to believe that you don't want to instantly know when another episode comes up. You go to the YouTube channel, you click on that red rectangle, and a bell pops up, and that's when you click the bell, and you will be instantly notified. And I mean instantly in its traditional sense, when YouTube gets around to it, uh, notified that a new episode has been uploaded. If you have uh, so desire, please share us with your family, friends, and foe. And if you like this episode, and we know you do, click that like button on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, George, I see a plethora of animals in your office today. What's going on? Yes, uh, Susan's in San Francisco. And so I'm a bachelor father with uh, three small boys to care for these <laughs> next this week and next week. All right. I so, have Ju I have Jasper on the couch and Julius and Cosmo on the two red chairs in back of me. Cool. All right. Let's hope no strangers walk by and we don't have a barking fiasco. Uh, if people notice, I am not in Sasquatch this week. Uh, Sasquatch is in the shop back in Rapid City, and we still had to continue our trip to South Dakota here, uh, Sioux Falls, where we got to intern Dad's ashes at the cemetery, and that was a big ceremony with family and friends from around the, the country. And I did, you know, when you're a kid, you don't know how popular your dad is, and apparently my dad was pretty popular. He had a lot of people show up for the funeral, and that was a, uh, a special event. And this is Rye. <laughs> I have an animal too. George, let's uh, get on to, I'm sorry, uh, our hotel here in Sioux Falls is right next to the airport, and they only have three or four planes go out of Sioux Falls uh, per day. Apparently, there's a 943 flight that leaves. George, let's uh, begin with the news here. I'm going to go and get the number one story is going to be Mike Pilavachi update. Uh, Matt Redman has announced that he was a victim of Mike, and... Uh, it, the story won't die. No, the, it, this is a story that keeps coming out in drips and drops. Uh, uh, Mike Pilavachi. Now, Kevin and I mispronounce his name every show, and so we'll get there. We're he trying to Come on. I got Mike right. <laughs> he, he is the founder and uh, the engine behind a uh, youth, or, youth uh, contemporary worship uh, ministry soul survivor church mm -hmm. of england that's very influential in evangelical and charismatic circles and he has been accused of uh, sexual misconduct with young men massages and things of that nature and no rapes or anything like that but just behavior that is inappropriate as well as uh, spiritual abuse of you know you can't tell anybody this stuff and what this, not? Is, this is something special that only the two of us are doing, and it's, yeah. you know... God absolutely. wants us to do this and all yes. that. Well, Matt Redman, who is a popular Christian songwriter in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, came out to announce that some of the things that have been in, printed in the press, he was subjected to also by, by Mike Pilavachi. S during all these last weeks, Pilavachi has resigned from Soul Survivor, from the Church of England uh, ministry. Uh, and the poor Church of England just, it's the, 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 the secular media's trust in it is so poor. Uh, it's the, the, the now writing stories about the Church of England and safeguarding and things like that, where on along the lines of when did the Church of England leaders stop beating their wives? Yeah, absolutely. And so for instance, you know, some, some spokesman says, well, 
Pilavachi isn't going to be disciplined at this, you know, we're going to recommend that he have psychological counseling. And so the outrage is in the readers of the stories is that, well, he won't, nothing happens for bad behavior. Well, you get disciplined after a trial. It's not, you know, Alice in Wonderland is where you have sentence first, trial afterwards. So Pilavachi hasn't had an ecclesiastical discipline or trial. He's just sort of short-circuited things by yeah, trying but, to but jump he, out. He jumped out, he resigned. And can you bring a person who's resigned to trial? Uh, it's harder because mm -hmm. they have very little... Uh, you have very little leverage over them. You can mm -hmm. still go through the trial, but you still have to go through all the hoops of evidence and procedure and this and that. And he can uh, decline to cooperate, which makes it even harder. Uh, and then he get they get a default judgment against him, all that stuff. But the point being this uh, Pilavachi's abuses evidently were known to the, his board for over 20 years. He has a senior assistant, Andy Croft, who's the son of uh, Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford now, who is the one who was uh, uh, being beaten up for his inaction over the uh, priest rapist uh, Trevor at uh, Van Manikam. So it's uh, just the, it's, 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 it's almost like uh, somebody's laid a field full of rakes in front of the Church of England and it takes one step and a rake smack, pops up and smacks him in the face. Then they take another step, smacks him in the face. This is an institution that has a terrible reputation uh, in the public sphere. And that reputation is, I hate to say it, it's starting to get well earned of uncaring, bureaucratic, rigid, tone deaf. Well, let's go with that. case has it all. Yeah, let's go with the tone deaf because we're going to talk about the follow up here to General Synod, which has finally ended. But this is the General Synod that just you leave with that icky feeling. We're reading articles of people who attended that just um, found nothing good about it. And we're going to report specifically about a person who resigned. Uh, oops, that, oops, that's your phone. You going to get it? No, I declined it. You declined it, okay. Uh, Gavin Drake, a uh, communications person for the Church of England, has resigned in protest over the safeguarding debacle. And it's interesting. Gavin Drake. Yeah. Yeah, he, he works for the Anglican Consultative Council and is the uh, communications director for Anglican Communion News Service. Mm -hmm. He's also a member of General Synod, an elected delegate, which... How do you do that? I don't know... <laughs> Uh, you know, I, that that's a little, that's a line I don't think we would cross. We couldn't be both uh, the hunter and the hunted. No. But there you go. He resigned and put out a public letter because he was just so appalled at the Church of England's and the Archbishop's Council's refusal to take responsibility for the safeguarding fiasco. Um, it's... You know, there are calls now made by both the left and the right for Welby to resign, to take responsibility. There are allegations that Welby lied to General Synod, where uh, Welby was asked a question, direct question, I believe it was by Sam Margrave, a delegate to convent to Synod, friend of this show is Margrave. Uh, how did you vote? And what did you think and do? And and Welby said, well, the archbishops, both of us, were against it. Uh, but uh, then the but the official spokesman for the Church of England said it was unanimous from start to finish. So which is it? In other words, we have two official statements, Welby's response to a question. And what was even more telling is that Welby, before he answered Margrave's question, like paused and, you know, sort of had a one of these things where you put your hand over the microphone yes, and talk to I. the lawyer next to you. <laughs> And after getting a legal clearance, he gave this, I was against it initially, sort of, you know, half answer. So the, the, the general synods, and I'm not talking about the deputies or delegates to it, but the leadership, really their moorings to Christian decency and morality and mission pretty well severed at this stage. I hate to put it in that 
stark terms, but this is now an institution whose sole goal is its per survival and perpetuation. It, the goal of winning England for Christ and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't think that, you know, they voted down affirming Alpha and Christianity Explored because they were too partisan uh, to have synods backing and all this and that. Now, these are rather uh, innocuous in the sense of they're not political. They are focusing on bringing the good news of Christ. Now, they do come out of evangelical alphas out of Holy Trinity Brompton and a Christianity Explored out of all, all, all Souls lying in place. So, yes, those are evangelical parishes, but they're not in any way uh, partisan uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, Synod couldn't even c take the step to commend those programs. Well, as we talked about before, um, the Synod and certainly the Church of England is all about protecting the bureaucracy. Uh, mm -hmm. Every time they can make an advancement in Christianity, they, they shy away. Anytime they could make an advancement of, of growing the church, they shy away. And we we know now that uh, they're losing money, they're losing staff, and people are starting to jump ship. Uh, Brett Murphy jumped ship this week. Uh, mm -hmm. some, who else jumped ship? Uh, got a list of people here. Um, well, let, let's start with Murphy. Sure. Murphy is okay. a young uh, evangelical clergyman who's mm -hmm. got an internet presence, a uh, YouTube uh, presence. It's pretty good, very good. Mm -hmm. um, and he is that sort of bright, uh, enthusiastic, energetic young priest in his 30s who you want to raise up and who you want to encourage and who you want to give all the support you can because he will produce the goods. And he resigned from the Church of England and joined the Free Church of England and has been given a Morbin parish in Morecambe Bay, which I believe is on the northwest corner of England. It's a holiday resort. Uh, looks pretty in the summer, but I would think it's depressing nine months of the year. And he's, uh, you know, his reasons for leaving the Church of England are the same things I heard when the, the mass defections from the AC, from the Episcopal Church were taking place. I cannot be part of an apostate organization. Um, the Episcopal Church has been terribly wounded by what happened uh, with the secessions. Now, good many of them were kicked out by Catherine Deffert Shore. Yeah, I don't want to use the secession. I mean, 770 some were defrocked. Uh, yeah, it's a good like number were kicked out, <laughs> yeah. but also a number withdrew on their own, mm -hmm. before, maybe before they were kicked out. But what it has done is it's so weakened the Episcopal Church in many places that they're either moribund or the only people left are the kooks. Um, Colorado, for instance, once used to be a very good diocese. Yeah. Now it is la la land. I mean, the the bishop, uh, it's a female African American bishop who has a, a young child and she talks about helping the child find its gender. I mean, we're we're in cuckoo cloud land with some of these people. Well, I mean, but, but the I, same exists in the Church of England. The Church of England in its Sunday schools. Uh, or Sunday schools, in its schools, teaches critical race theory, um, teaches about the climate emergency. Uh, it does not teach about uh, the living God. Yeah, the, the Church of England, uh, in a bizarre move, has adopted the American Black Lives Matter racial uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. They've come up and they're teaching, and it's some dioceses are further along than others, but they're teaching this white supremacy pyramid that at the bay, at where you basically go through the steps, at the bottom is casual prejudice, and at the very pinnacle of the pyramid is genocide. And it goes through all these steps, and so little eight, nine-year-old English children are being taught to, you know, about the Ku Klux Klan and cross-burning. Oh, Kevin... For, help me if I'm wrong, but I didn't think that was a problem in England. Have mm -hmm. you got a lot? Of, have they got Klansmen roaming around the streets that we're unaware of? Uh, not, not that I am aware of, and we've not had that here in America since the uh, uh, mid '60s. Uh, it, it, it is not a problem. It was a problem. It is a stain and certainly a scar on the history of America, but that's not a stain or a scar in England. 
England was the first uh, country to pop out of slavery, thanks to a, a, a heroic English Church of Church of Englishmen. So, the, uh-huh. the and what the Church of England anti-racism program is teaching is really it's teaching white race uh, racism against whites mm-hmm. to make children, uh, you know, white pride is considered a form of of uh, national nastiness, xenophobia. Mm-hmm. While black pride is considered right and good and true, uh, it's it's getting it's really weird. Um, well, it's weird. No, I wouldn't say it's weird because uh, yes, there is a desire for tribalism. There's a de- de- desire for kinmanship, and this desire has been manifested in replacing racism with racism. Mm-hmm. And that's what's happening and, here in the West, certainly. And true to form, the director of education for the Church of England defended the programs with an absolutely obtuse public statement saying that we need to teach children about racism before they're 18 years old. I agree. We need to teach children about racism. But the methods of using something that's that a Black Lives Matter activist or an Antifa activist or a professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin at Madison came up with it's wholly inappropriate for the English setting. Um, well, but you don't teach children, uh, kindergarten or middle schoolers, theories like black, mm-hmm. you know, like critical race theory. That's wholly inappropriate for our education system because the teachers don't understand it's just a theory. The teachers think this is gospel. You're white, you are a racist. It says right here in the text. <laughs> so that is, it goes so far beyond theory, George. We talked about other defections and resolu- uh, you know, we've got it from the parish level, people like Brett Murphy. Mm-hmm. We had Meg Munn, who was the chairman of this independent safeguarding board. And she was beaten up by Synod and by the two people who had already resigned. And then she put out her letter resigning and saying, my God, you know, Welby just stabbed me in the back. He wouldn't support me. He wouldn't do the things that needed to be done. He wasn't. Ser- he isn't serious about safeguarding. The two people who resigned because they wouldn't work with me, they wouldn't work with me because they thought I was a tool of Welby. And I'm, not only was I not a tool of Welby, Welby actively undermined me and sought to uh, nullify any real work done by the Independent Safeguarding Board. Now, Meg Munn, I think, is a former MP, if I'm not mistaken, or if, if not, she's a person of some prominence yeah, in the in the English setting, certainly in the safeguarding field. She's a licensed social worker and everything. And the calls for Welby to step down over the mistakes are not just pure personal animosity. This is, you know, this is his you know, this is like Anheuser Busch and uh, Ron, Ron. <laughs> Bud Light <laughs> and the yeah. Bud Light fiasco, yeah. um, where like you you are destroying your brand for harebrained decisions. You know, Bud Light has always tasted like horse piss. Excuse me. Uh, so it's nothing new, but you know, you sold it in large quantities to fraternity boys and to guys <clears throat> going to football games. That's always been the case, but when somebody at the top changes things um now you you know i was at this grocery store the other day uh, i was at the grocery store before the fourth of july weekend mm-hmm. at public s- markets we have here in florida and i went down the beer aisle to get some ice at the far end everything at you know all the millers gone all oh. the cores is gone bud light is completely stacked front to back and they're almost giving the stuff away mm-hmm. in price sure nobody would take it mm-hmm. i mean I don't think Bud Light is ever going to come back, but hey. Well, and that's the thing. You have to be a strong enough brand that you can advertise that way. Bud Light was not a strong enough brand. I don't know if Maybelline, uh, who has a a new transgendered commercial where men are putting on lipstick, and and I don't know if they can survive uh, that type of advertising. There are strong companies who, if they decided to do it, could. Um, their brand is well, strong enough, but like you said, Bud Light is beer is basically you know, mountain piss. It's probably not going to. Uh, it will not survive. Well, in some respects, uh, 
Justin Welby is the Phoebe Waller Bridge of the Church of England. Now, for those who don't know, Ouch. Phoebe yeah. is the female lead in the new Indiana Jones movie, which has already been, been pulled from our local multiplex theater here in Hooterville. Uh, so you can now watch the Mission Impossible movie and The Sound of Freedom and some horror flicks. Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones is gone because its word of mouth was so horrible about it being PC and so anti-Indiana Jones, the spirit of it. A bit, and it was all personified by this very uh, insufferable woke actress. Um, in some respects, Welby is assuming that role of being sort of the poster child for insufferable wokeness. Mm -hmm. um, it's well, killed the Indiana Jones franchise. Uh, it's killed Bud Light. This, this way of thinking, this way of acting. It's killed Indiana Jones. Uh, Disney is going to take a bath. Hundreds of millions of dollars probably is not going to is going to be lost. Bud Light is never going. Well, I think is it Dos Equis is now or the the Mexican Modelo. Uh, Modelo. Modelo is yeah. now. Mo no, Modelo is an American company. We just use Mexican, <laughs> yes, Mexican actors in its commercials. Mm -hmm. But no, Modelo is now more popular than the Budweiser brand. Modelo and is number just, one, and Bud and Bud Light is now twenty four. You know, uh, that's so. just remarkable. Now let, but let's do a compare and contrast: Bud Light versus the Church of England. Church of England uh, in Senate passed the. Uh, climate emergency liturgy, or, or suggested it, where they're going to have uh, future clergy people, when they take their oath, have to take an oath, oath to love thy earth and respect it. Ouch. They, we, ported, we first reported the stirrings of this about a year or so ago, where the Diocese of Oxford unilaterally changed the confirmation rite, adding another promise made which is to respect the integrity of creation and this and that. They added a love Gaia, love the earth, worship the earth, hug the tree uh, line in addition to uh, uh, love the Lord your God and uh, reject the devil and of all his works and pomps and this and that. And there's nothing wrong with environmental uh, activism. There's nothing wrong with uh, believing firmly in this, but when you try to make the greeny weeny uh, revolution part of the tenets of the Christian faith, that's a problem. And what we're seeing is, you know, that you know, transgenderism for some people is is a religion. Mm -hmm. Environmentalism for some people is a religion. The the, the latest Nobel Prize winner in physics. Uh, just was interviewed the other day, and he said all this climate change stuff is utter, complete nonsense. I know, human uh, influence human. climate change. Anthropogenic yeah. climate yeah. change. You know, yeah. you know there, there are, climate goes up, climate goes down, we've had ice ages, we don't have ice ages, this, that, mm -hmm. and the other thing. And the idea that, uh, that you getting a Tesla and uh, will save the planet is utter, nonsense um the but that is now being adopted as an article of faith again i have no problem with environmentalism i love living in this part of the world i love you know i, I was driving back from ocala hospital to our church and i'm passing the rolling fields and the cattle and the crops and everything and i just pulled over and just looked how beautiful it was where we live i like the green grass and all this and that. Mm -hmm. But to put it on par with the life and work and save and death of Jesus Christ on the cross as one of the promises that we seek to abide by, that's gone too far for me. It has. I mean, there's now a hysteria in the church is mm -hmm. responding to the climate hysteria in a, in a very incorrect way. What you want to do is raise up Christians, and when you raise up Christians, you raise up people who respect the earth, who respect and have dominion over the animals, and who respect each other and love each other, and even love their enemy. If you're going to raise up activists, you don't get that. And mm -hmm. what the Church of England here is trying to find uh, clerical activists. 
And I remember a yeah. conversation I had with the uh, new bishop of the American Lutheran Church about seven years ago, and he said that Lutheran seminaries are horrible because all I get are activists as uh, graduates of these seminaries. I don't get people who know anything about the gospel, anything about church history, anything about uh, how to grow a church. But boy, they can tell you everything you need to know about uh, CO2 and uh, all, all the green stuff going on around the world. And the Church of England seems to want to follow suit. As does the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to jump into the youth festival then? Uh, yeah, I guess, to make sure. We didn't talk about uh, William Taylor's taking on uh, Sarah Mahali. We missed okay, that one. Well, yeah. well uh, there is pushback mm -hmm. in England, the Church of England. Uh, William Taylor, the uh, rector of St. Helens Bishop's Gate, which is the uh, influential parish in the city of London, uh, he has been saying, you know, no more, no more. And he's doing it in concrete ways. He had a uh, ordinand that he presented for ordination, but sent him to the Free Church of England for ordination. So instead of having Bishop Mullally come and lay hands on him to make him a deacon and ultimately a priest, the uh, Free Church of England did. Now for this fellow, he is going to be a prison chaplain, so it was not going to be a career killer for him because mm -hmm. he's going into chaplaincy, which he just needs the ordination. But I think that he's got some more people coming down the pike, and he very well may just send them to the Free Church of England for ordination and then put them out into parishes that don't recognize the authority of the Bishop of London. Um, and Taylor was on the uh, put out a video the other day, which we uploaded to Anglican Inc., where he basically said the bishops of the Church of England have failed, utterly failed to be guardians of the faith uh, once you know, handed down by the saints. Um, we're seeing we're seeing action steps being taken. Now, some people are saying this is too fast. Who is he to do this? Other people are saying, why didn't he do this five years ago? Well, you, you do, you, we are not in his shoes. We do not know the pressures he's up facing, this and that. But uh, uh, there is a pushback in the Church of England. There is. We just so, need to see how strong it will be. Yeah, you mentioned the Episcopal Church just had a great youth festival. Uh, can't we talk? You just mentioned, uh, articulate here, that the Episcopal Church just had a wonderful youth festival they held. And I don't know because there's not a lot of press or pictures. It's kind of the, the uh, youth festival where nobody showed up, George. Well, certainly nobody other than Episcopal News Service showed yes. up. <laughs> there was a big, it's, it was called All About Love. Uh -huh. It's been advertised all year. We've mm -hmm. been getting little flyers of inviting us to send kids to it. and. And it was to be held in Baltimore, and it was held in Baltimore, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But uh, it could have been held uh, on a soundstage in uh, in Hollywood uh, for all the reality it had. Um, we did print Curry's address, sermon, speech to mm -hmm. the uh, group. Uh, Jeff Walton has taken apart uh, the speech of the direct of the president of the House of Deputies, Julia Harris, and. What is really surprising, not surprising, but what is really sad is that neither Curry nor Harris have an understanding of the true mission of the church. Harris was preaching to the young people a works theology, you know, do good, uh, more, uh, deistic moralism, as Fitzsimmons Allison used to call it, you know, <laughs> be a nice person, pay your taxes, uh, recycle uh don't, don't smoke in public buy, yeah don't buy gas guzzlers buy yeah. electric car in other words mm -hmm. what you can do for the planet and for god is what the church is in other words it's about what you can do mm -hmm. and michael curry gave one of his affirmation sermons god loves you stop right there what curry does not say is repent and sin no more get right with God. What Harris doesn't talk about is what God has done for us. She talks about what God has done for you. The, uh, the course, the Episcopal Church's theology 
as expressed by the, its two chief leaders, lay and cler clerical, is one that is no different from your high school civics class or from the uh, local uh, uh, Women's League of Voters. Well, it, it has, it's no different than the Gospel of John Lennon. All we need mm -hmm. is love. All you need mm -hmm. to do is uh, hold your hand. All you need to do is, yeah, you can go through all their different songs, and it's just a, a liturgy for what the Episcopal Church is teaching now. Um, we know that a, uh, a role as a Christian is one where God changes you. He purifies you. He willows you. They don't believe in that in the Episcopal Church, and they certainly don't believe that in the Church of England. There's no concept of sin and of the brokenness of humanity. And the idea of original sin is just doesn't connect and compute. And it's not just Lutheran churches that teach that. It's so many of the Anglican seminaries that are left, they're all sort of falling right and left, yeah. don't teach, uh, you know, the doctrines of the Bible. They teach feel-goodism. They, they teach, you know, pastoral counseling as sort of, uh, you know, God as a therapist. Rather, God is a redeemer, redeemer and saver and creator. But it, the, the, it's just a disconnect from the reality of Scripture. It is a disconnect. The problem is there is some truth to it. It's a half truth. God loves you absolutely. Oh my goodness, you can never ever understand how much God loves you. But <laughs> you know, they never get beyond the comma. God loves you, and it's really a, a tragedy. All right, let's... Yeah, you want well, I, I just, you know, we have a religion right now in the Episcopal Church akin to my children's uh, T-Ball League where everybody gets participation trophies. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's, there's no, uh, well, it's, it's not, and here's the thing, kids are not stupid. Um, some are very stupid, I have to admit, but, you know, they can tell phonies, they can tell what is real, and... What we're seeing, what I'm reading in the literature, sociological literature put out by people like the Barna, Found it, Barna Group, mm -hmm. and what I'm reading in the scholarly literature is that this current generation, and what are they called, Z or Millen? I don't know what the new name is. Uh, I would call it Generation Cosplay. Is the new generation, generation Cosplay, cosplay yes. There is, a, there is a longing for deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. And the shallowness of the Episcopal Church's Church of England's theology just isn't cutting it. Yeah, agreed. Let's move on to international politics, what we love to talk about. Uh, if you remember correctly, uh, China and the uh, Catholics agreed to um, merge the church with the uh, state church in 2020, was that, George? Uh, 2019, I think 2019, they signed right an agreement Canada and said, "Listen, we don't want you to have to hide your Christians in in, in the remote locations of China. That we can all agree that the the Roman Catholic Church and the Chinese Communist Party can work together, and we can come to an agreement where you can worship the way you want to wor worship, and we would feel comfortable with that." Surprise, surprise! Not to me, but and certainly not to George. The communists are reneging. The communists have decided that, uh, oh, thank you for giving us all the names of all the Christians who are coming out of the woodwork. Deal's over. Deal's over. Uh, this past um, week, uh, the, the part of the deal was that Peking can nominate uh, bishops and the Vatican will approve them. So it's done in consultation. The Vatican learned the new Bishop of Shanghai had been consecrated by a newspaper story. He was translated from one diocese to another with no interaction through the Vatican. And at his consecration ceremony, part of his ordination promises were to loyalty and fealty to the Chinese state. The, this is in direct violation of the protocol signed between the Vatican and the China, Chinese government. So the Chinese government now just doesn't care anymore. It doesn't, you know, it got what it wanted from this agreement, which was the merger of the underground Catholic Church with the patriotic Catholic Church, which was the official state Catholic Church. Um, 
now now that now that they've got everybody on board they're basically saying thank you francis uh uh don't let the door hit you on the way out yeah you sign now, away a lot of rights yeah and but one of the interesting things is that cardinal per, uh perlin per, pantolin the cardinal who basically negotiated this agreement and who has been the big booster for it has been forced to say that well we still have some underground Chinese Catholics in China. Not everybody joined up because they didn't trust the government. And so we'll still support these people. So a good number of the Chinese, so there are still going to be underground bishops. Sure. Um, there are, uh, Kevin and I are aware of an underground Anglican bishop uh, yeah. um, who is not on the government's radar or anything like that. Um, but because they these people these people have never trusted the promises of the Chinese government and are just keeping their distance and the Chinese government is getting really aggressive in its religious policies um, every every imam every pastor every priest every monk Buddhist Muslim Christian Taoist whatever has to be registered with the state and has to be basically monitored by the state so they know who they are and if they say or do anything, if they step out of line, they can be silenced. And if they persist, they can be disappeared. The uh, uh, churches in some part of the uh, country, uh, they are forbidden from uh, having children in their worship services. If you want to put your child in a school, and all schools are state schools, you must sign a document in some provinces that say you will not send them to church. So the Chinese government is trying to wipe out Christianity by starting with the kids. And in other places, uh, there's a big conference in Northeast China uh, where Ch Chinese Christians talked about the missionary work that they're going to do. And it's sharing this of, of Chinese Christianity that is loyal to the party in missionary settings. So they'll go to the Solomon Islands, they'll go to places where China has an economic uh, agreements or presence, parts of Africa, and they will start teaching and preaching this form of Christianity, which is subservient to the state, as opposed to the traditional Christianity or the, the faithful Christianity. China, um, is taking an approach, you know, the North Koreans, they just kill you. They just kill you. They don't, you know. And even after 40, 50, what is it now? 70 years, there's still, yeah. still an underground church in North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese are not taking that approach. They're trying to sort of sap it from within and pervert the church through indoctrination and getting rid of the outspoken leaders and indoctrinating the youth into a false form of Christianity. Wait, and hold on. It, wait, it, hold. Is that not what the Episcopal Church is doing? And is that not what the Church of England is doing, George? I don't want to go hard on the communist when we're do, already doing it here in America. Well, the thing is, you know, I have total freedom to basically go, eh, yeah. you know, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, you know, be faithful to the Lord. I have no, you know, at, at the end of time, uh, did you listen to the uh, General Convention of the Episcopal Church or did you listen to the Gospel of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ? And I can, with a clear conscience, say I went that way, not yeah. that way. Uh, but the, uh, it, Hong Kong is the next battlefield. And we the need Ta to pray Taiwan, for our- Ta Taiwan or Hong Kong? In the church, well, Battlefield, battlefield, with guns, okay, right, maybe right, Taiwan. Yeah, okay, all right. But, but battlefield for the soul and spirit and protection of the church is going to be Hong Kong. Sure. And right now, the churches in Hong Kong are still independent of state control. Mm -hmm. But And we have a brand new Catholic cardinal who's only in his 60s, which is pretty young for a cardinal. He's one of the youngest ones. And we have a new young archbishop, Anglican archbishop, and these men are going to be under intense pressure to conform 
And at first we'll see their property stripped away if they don't play ball. And then we'll see their schools closed. And then we'll see their, you know, loyalists to the party put into positions of authority. Okay, your archdeacon has to be somebody we approve. And you, we really need to pray for the wisdom of the Christian leaders of Hong Kong. How do they go forward with a regime that is not only hostile, but seeks to subvert them from within? Yeah. It, it's I easier think, to deal with somebody who's just blatantly hostile because you just go into the catacombs. Well, what do you do when they're injecting their loyalists into your organization? Who do you trust? And I think the communists, certainly in China, have learned this well. It's kind of like an invasion of the body snatchers. You know, we would slowly uh, uh, take over your organization by becoming you. Uh, and, and putting our people, or, or I'm not going to say Manchurian candidates, but putting our, our people in place uh, so that when the vote comes up, they vote for us. They don't vote for you anymore. You know? but in many ways, it's the same progressive path uh, that has been taken in the West in the destruction of the, of the institutions, the, mm -hmm. the universities, the church, the government, the legal profession, Hollywood, where just starting, starting when you and I were young, the poison entered in, sure. not as an overt attack, but just so now you have corporate, you know, so, you know, when I was in, you know, studying in college and I had friends who were going to the business world, I didn't think they'd turn out this way. But, you know, like chief executive of United Airlines saying it's more important for us that we have black and women pilots than it is well-trained pilots. Um, you know, when did, you know, the corporate world become an adjunct to the liberal uh, woke world? It is but a it sacred, and here's the new quote, sacred duty of the United States uh, to be sure that our military has access to abortions. Yeah, well, there you I go. saw that. I mean, it just <laughs> and, and that the new, ch you know, they're, in a, they're having hearings from the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's the Air Force Chief of Staff. Mm hmm and this guy is on the record saying that we have too many white pilots we need and we're having too many white generals we need to have parity with the number of women and minority pilots and this and that and so you know there's nothing wrong with a qualified woman or a qualified minority being a pilot but when you basically say i'm going to you know landing on landing an airplane is a tough t landing on a carrier is even harder <laughs> And when you say we're not going to judge you on how well you land your car on a carrier, but the color of your skin or the mm -hmm. your chromosomes, whether or not you get into the program, you know, we're, we're in trouble. We are. Well, it's not just, you know, bravery and, and tactics and training that make a, a, a good Navy pilot. My uncle was a uh, Navy pilot who would land planes in a car on a carrier. And it takes just a little bit of quirkiness, too. To be that type of person who's willing to land a plane on a hundred uh 300 foot carrier that's crazy just a little bit of that too so um but there's also a power vacuum that's uh leading here here in america uh, our policy is pretty much hands off we are ant currently anti-israel um so we're leaving a power vacuum there we're uh we're hands off completely in the middle east Anti, we're anti-Saudi now, yeah, anti-Israel. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel had a big uh, agreement and a, a peace accord they signed two or three years ago. Uh, it seems the U.S. is almost against that uh, in, in recent years. And, yeah, and, and you know we're nicer to Iran these days than we are to Saudi Arabia and this and that. And this vacuum of, and I'll call it Anglo-American leadership, because Americans and British go hand in hand in these yeah. things. Um, we're seeing it on small levels. Recently, the president of Iran went to Uganda and he went there to promote trade and cultural and all the sort of stuff, bilateral relations between Uganda and Iran. And the head of the Uganda Council of Religious Leaders, which is the Council of Churches plus the Muslims and anybody else, is Archbishop Stephen Kazimba of Uganda. And Archbishop Kazimba met and uh, welcomed uh, economic relations, bilateral relations, cultural exchanges, this and that. 
And from an American perspective, this is pretty, you know, hey, guys, you should be on our side. You should be, you know, pushing, pushing Iran to get rid of its nuclear weapons and for democracy and this and that. And instead, you're welcoming them and their dollars. And now there was one story that is, I doubt, which was that uh, the archbishop commended Iran on its uh, policies towards homosexuals, which is killing them and everything. Um, one thing you need to remember is that you cannot trust the Ugandan press. There are a lot of liars out there. <laughs> a and, lot of people who you know, do a lot of clickbait, yes. Yeah. And also remember uh, about 10 years ago, 2010 it was, there was a huge controversy of, you know, a, a pro-gay preacher was his head, he was beheaded and his body was decapitated and this and that, and it was just terrible and integrity Uganda just ran a fundraising campaign to help us fight the murder of pro-gay pastors. And it turned out to be all a con job. Nobody was murdered. It never murdered. happened. Yeah. It never happened. And mm -hmm. and in fact, the church Uganda just put out another warning about a guy named Eric Kizire, uh, who was uh, the fraudster involved in that last story. He's back again, and he's peddling stories about the... Uh, this new gay law and all the people suddenly disappearing from the streets. Well, take it with a grain of salt. That having been said, uh, so we can't really trust the gay part of the story, but the other parts of the story of cooperation, economic, cultural, and whatnot, we can confirm through the official speeches and whatnot. This is a failure of Western diplomacy. This is a failure of well-beism in the Anglican communion. Well-beism, you know, well-beism has so sullied the brand in some places that the Ugandans are, you know, charting their own course. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't, you know, how can you, how can you uh, look up to the Church of England or the Episcopal Church when you just had a general synod that was so atrocious as it was, when you've had a generation, the Episcopal Church being as kooky as it is? Well, you know, but this exists in all planes of denominations. Pope Francis, no power. Justin Welby, no power, no influence. Uh, Michael Curry, who? Uh, you, you know, any denomination you want to talk about, there is no influence in the secular world whatsoever. 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would see stories appear uh, occasionally in newspapers where they would quote a Billy Graham. They would get a snippet from even Pat Robertson. They would you know, have some, uh, a quote from Pope Francis, uh, and those, those don't exist anymore. We've completely been vacuumed out of culture, and we've lost that benefit well, of the doubt. One, one interesting thing was there was a, uh, a series of there was a Republican town halls moderated by Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. Now Tucker Carlson attends an ACNA parish, or he did before he moved uh, to Florida, mm -hmm. and he interviewed Mike Pence, who also attends an ACA parish. So you've got, <laughs> if you will, the two highest profile ACNA people, lay people yeah. that I'm aware of, and. One of the things that Tucker Carlson laid into Mike Pence was religious freedom in the Ukraine. That Pence, Carlson basically said the conventional wisdom from the secular press that were war, that uh, Zelensky is another George Washington, that there's freedom and tr truth and justice and all this and that is an utter lie. And Pence, you know, was, well, he had a bad time of it with Tucker Carlson and his political career appears to be over. But all of the, you know, Carlson has been repeating things that you and I have been saying for years. Um, about he probably, well, as an Anglican, he probably watches the show. I think we just have to assume that Tucker Carlson watches our show, George. Okay, because yes, we're yeah, being but, quoted. <laughs> but the, but the, you know, the status of the Russian Orthodox Church may be miserable in the eyes of the New York Times and other places. But it is growing in influence. It's growing in influence in Asia. It's growing in influence in places, you know, such that Patriarch uh, Bartholomew 
at the meeting of the European Council of Churches last month that uh, we uh, we need to work against an alliance of the Russian Orthodox and American Evangelicals. Oh. So, oh my. Well, people know we're busy people. I get interrupted all the time. It's okay, George. Um, but okay. we're also I, seeing... I need to show you I have a water and I need to bless this water. Oh, please, go for it. Do okay. Do you, uh, do you want me to do it right now? Well, sure. we're setting up. Okay. Well, uh, I can't do it. Wrong. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll bring it back. I'll bring it out to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's oh, awesome. Wow. But now the dynamics have changed uh, considerably as far as you know. We, we fear that China will invade Taiwan. Um, I think that's probably less now than it was two years ago. China has been buying a lot of its military armaments from Russia. And mm -hmm. seeing how uh, <laughs> Russia armaments have not stood up to, uh, and I'm going to say it, NATO defenses um, and, and NATO offensive weapons, uh, China may be a little weirded out by you know, going into Taiwan, where right now the best defense is already set up. You know, they have the Patriot missile systems and stuff like that. I, I would, if I were Taiwan, I would change where I buy my armaments from. So, well, Taiwan has been selling some of its uh, missiles yeah, to that. the United States to ship to Ukraine. <laughs> so, if Taiwan, if they on the ground think that they're in a position where they can make a few bucks by selling some of their munitions to the U.S. for us to ship to Ukraine, I. Mm -hmm may be a hint that they're not expecting an invasion. Well, and I don't remember the numbers, but I think it's uh, 12,000 of the latest tanks that China acquired came from uh, Russia before the war. That's crazy, because they know they're worthless. <laughs> like, I want my money back. <laughs> Do you offer warranties, guarantees? All right, I think that's the last story we have. We talked about the uh, the vacuum. Um, so cool. We're off to another location next week. We'll let you know when we get there so that uh, uh, we have time to, to get the right reservations and let you know if Sasquatch is working again. Um, George, when does, when does Susan come back? Uh, you, you've been she a comes back a week from Friday. I've got to bless this holy water for the funeral, for the okay, font. Okay. Um, All right, so good. So uh, life goes on its merry way. And it shall. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Congan. You've been watching episode 812 of Anglican Unscripted.